Hi everyone, sorry about that. Um, we've just got Kelly Wakels down in Perth. Um, she's on the GoTo meeting, so we just needed to get her sorted. Um, just really want to welcome everyone here today. I um, also want to acknowledge um, the Yari people um, and just pay our respects um, as we're meeting here today on their country. Um, my name's Leah Pearson. I'm the Marine Park Coordinator for 80 Mile Beach, for those who don't know me. Um, and this is Christopher Nutt, um, Marine Park Coordinator for Rollies and Robart Bay. Um, we're here, uh, we've got Pete Bayless in the room and Marley Hutton, who's been working on this project. Um, really exciting um, to have Pete back here and to present the results of the Jugong survey um, and to also look at how we move forward with this information, like he'll give us a brief overview of the results today, but then what we want to move into is how we actually take these results and use them for management in the park. Um, we've actually got a baseline data set and not just for dugongs, for the mammals in the marine parks now, for Roebuck Bay and 80 Mile Beach, which is really exciting. Um, it also feeds into a really uh, good data set for the actual Kimberley region itself, and Peter will probably touch on that in his presentation. Um, so we have sent around the draft report, but um, he will give us his presentation, but then we'll move into a bit of a discussion section. Um, so please participate, please throw those ideas around. Um, I guess from a parks, parks perspective, like Roebuck Bay is here in Broome, so a little bit easier logistically than 80 Mile Beach, um, but it would be really good to, when we're moving forward with these projects and how we actually run management in the parks, we are looking across the parks themselves and not just at the parks individually. Um, and this project allows us to do that, which is really exciting. Um, so I'll hand over to Pete. Um, and if you've got any questions as we go through, um, please raise them. And Pete's a guru, so he'll be able to answer them for you. <laughs> Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, well, to, uh, the last presentation, I told her I had some dental work, so the same is true again. So if you can't understand what I'm talking about, just stick your hand up, and I don't mind repeating it again. Um, so I'll just whiz through it. So that's the, that's the title of the um, Wangsy Dugong project. It's been going for a few years. Um, I wasn't there when it kicked off. Otherwise, I probably would have come all the way down the room. You know, there was just enough funding to do the full North Kimberley Ranger groups and do that area. Do a little bit uh, through some fun and we got some clear. We've managed to extend the um, survey down to um, Port Headland, which includes 80 Mile Beach and Roebuck Bay. Um, so, this is an outline in case we get lost along the way. So, I'm just going to recap on the project. Um, so, I'll give the recap. Um, critical is Indigenous Knowledge and Research Partnership. So, that was one of the, the key things about the whole project. The whole uh, aims of the research was to map the baseline distribution of the bonus of vehicles, but use an aerial servo technique, fixing aircraft, flying very fast, you can cover a lot of country in a very short period of time. Uh, then we kicked off a bit of a trial uh, study of movements using satellite tanks. Um, it wasn't that successful because we didn't see that many dugongs, but we did get some valuable information back. But the whole idea with that movement stuff is it's just a start. We've got some tanks here, we've got the infrastructure. It's really a long-term project, really. You can't have to, to give any answers in a couple of weeks, really. Um, and then just a couple of uh, couple of metrics to integrate Indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge. I mean, that's the title of the, of the project. So, I mean, how do you actually do that? So, work out one matching method. There might be others. Um, then we got the funding to extend um, from the North Kimberley to the South Kimberley all the way to part of Port Headland. And Marley was on that server and she trained to be an um, environmental observer and all that sort of stuff. So she'll be giving that part of the presentation. That's pretty relevant to what you guys are interested in. And put the two together uh, for a bit of a regional overview of the whole thing. We all did that quickly. Um, but the, key, the whole idea of this presentation really is uh, not just for us to throw your maps and data and all that sort of stuff, um, which you're going to have copies of anyway. But we want your ideas about how you think it went, what we didn't do, what we should have done, um, what the future is for doing our research and management. So what are the priorities, your priorities? So Marley's going to facilitate that session, everybody's involved, but that's about half of what we want out of this presentation, at least, maybe more. Um, so the Kimberley Dugong project, it was um, 
partnership project. It wasn't just, um, you know, uh, involving a few, doing, you know, a bit of engagement involved, you know, get permission to live on country. We actually uh, we set up a research committee. And for each one of those groups, Palangara, Wongagumbo, Daddy McGarry, and Barty, Barty Jarvie, we formed a research committee. Uh, so we had a representative from each of those range of groups on the research committee. So right from the word go, we got together and we made it out what was important, what we had to do and how, how we went about it. Um, that really should be the model for all research projects in, on your country, please. So a bit of background, the management of dugong populations, um, whether it's in, when we started, there was a lot of opposed marine parks, but now they're all marine parks, right? So uh, when we first started, uh, management of dugong populations can co-manage marine parks, or in sea country, we'll need to address uh, combined risk of increased pressures for development, people and climate change. So the increase in pressures is real, I mean, we ran a series of workshops with the Kimberley Land Council with 14 groups in the Kimberley and their biggest fear was all the development pressure from irrigation, mining, trees, mumbling. A lot of it there's benefits, it brings in income, but there's a lot of costs in it as well. <coughs> so um, things are pretty pristine and a little bit at the moment. I mean, um, the Kimberley is home to probably one of the biggest pristine dugong populations in the whole world. It's a safe haven for dugong. You know, internationally, globally. Uh, but there are, there are increasing pressures on the horizon which you've got to keep an eye on. So this whole idea of developing methodology, uh, particularly integrating uh, indigenous and scientific knowledge to toolbox approach, it's really important to um, to use that to keep an eye on these increasing pressures because it's going to happen locally. It's happened everywhere else in Australia. So. Um, one thing I noticed when I come here is that the Indigenous range of groups already had a framework you know, for monitoring and assessment. It's called the Healthy Country Planning Process. And all we did, uh, and they had management targets for saltwater country, and in some places, um, this is in a previous research program I was involved in, we set up some uh, systematic scientific monitoring programs for turtles and seagrass and you know, some places of dugongs. So they've been going for several years, we published a couple of papers. And that information goes into the healthy country planning process and hopefully we'll go into the, into the management plans for the marine parks that are in that area. So that's the thing about the North Kingdom. There's, um, well, that's sea country, maybe title sea country, but there's also a lot of these national parks, these marine parks, out the sea. So, you know, they're right on top of each other, so they need to be, over time, they'll be managed together. Um, You'll be working together, you'll be setting up your own monitoring programs, all that sort of stuff. The only big gap, I guess, is uh, Rabbi Baker and here, the depth in Pedersha, and what goes on in Sound is probably the only place where it's going to start to ring park, but that might come in the future, if you're interested. So, the aims of the project were to first like develop the long term research partnerships with those four groups that I've talked about. Um, and develop methods to integrate um, Indigenous and scientific knowledge so we we'll get how best to go about monitoring that everybody's happy with. Uh, but basically for the aerial survey, uh, work is, is to look at the, re you know, to work out the regional scale caps of Google and distribution of abundance. So in a broad sense, where are they? Roughly how many they are, but where are they? What are the, the key areas, the hot areas? areas? Um, and we thought uh, we had a bit of money I managed to get out of size, so we thought we'd just kick off a bit of a movement study. It wasn't in the original plan, so what we had the uh, in the satellite tank in the front, we thought we'd kick it off. Just to set a seed, plan the seed for, for future long term studies. Do you mind if I grab a drink of water before we now? So where do we start in this whole research program? So basically it all depends on seagrass. So where you find seagrass, you'll find dugong generally. And you find seagrass in shallow coastal waters generally in less than 20 metres. So if there is dugong in seagrass, and I think uh, 
tell how it's been open for some of the patterns we found, and I think in future people you know, start to get their deep water sea glass, but it requires underwater drones, videos, and, you know, that sort of sampling type here, and boats. So um, I know you guys got a boat. Ains and Syrah got boats and all that sort of gear that can go underwater and sample sea glass and drink water. So there was no information on where the sea glass might be, so I got one of our remote sensors who looked at, put up a mosaic of uh, Landsat farmers. She's been doing this for about 30 years, so she's an expert in this. And she mapped what she called the sea glass based on the the um, reflectance images coming off that, that remote sensor satellite capture. And she came up with that classification. So we're only able to really um, calibrate or validate areas to get the perfect intelligence. See in there, but there's a lot of this is um, uncalibrated, but it's a start. And I, um, in this project to the North Kingley, a very, very tight relationships between that seagrass and the dugong and bunnies. Really, really strong relationships, which is a really useful management tool, actually. So, you know, in future, if, you, <laughs> if you're getting dugong estimates of below what what you think should be there because of sea glass, you know there's a management problem. There's some other pressure besides sea glass. Well, I just thought I'd throw that up because um, a lot of people don't even know we did there. It's a valuable resource. You guys are welcome to it. It's a geo's resource. Every time you go out, say someone says up a sea glass study, then you use that information, you feel it with a natural proof of that. Over five years, you'll end up with a good map. So, uh, one of the first things we did uh, with this with this project team was to say, well, how can we use the digital scholars to actually design this survey? You know, usually scientists come in, they you know, they wake up the design, they go off and do it, and throw the information out of the back then sort of thing. But we actually sat down and uh, they gave me the maps of all the cultures that do almost and turtles. And so those areas are the important ones to target. So we put more survey effort, more transects into those areas. Um, and also, we, we did go past the 20 metre perfusion line. Uh, a lot of the N2 survey, that red line that we did, they finished that work at the same time we finished ours. They, uh, about 30, 40% of the survey effort was past the 20 metre water depth line, and they hardly saw any dugongs. You know, that's been close to a million bucks on that survey. They could have saved half a million bucks. Uh, but we saved, I reckon we saved about 35% of our cost on that survey when we design it. it's what's called the stratified design before you actually go out. So that was the first thing we did about combining and giving us knowledge for scientific knowledge. Um, I just thought I'd throw this in because I'm not sure there's not many people from here that were at the last talk where we went into this in quite a bit of detail. But basically those um These lines are called this, this and survey blocks. So there's seven of them, seven of them, and they're just artificial. We just do it for logistic reasons so we can actually, we won't run out of fuel, we can find fuel blocks and all that sort of stuff. These are the transect lights. This was transect lights. So from those, uh, along those lines, we fly an aircraft and that's use a single wing. And on either side of the plane, we count dugongs and turtles and anything we see really in the 200 metre transect width. So we put those together and we've got a 400 metre combined transect width for each transect. So all those numbers are fed into programs so I've knocked up to work out how many dugongs there are. Um, it's not that easy, there's, um, uh, there's a transect which you can see on there. Uh, there's a and that's us uh, calibrating our transit whistle on the ground. So when we record dugongs or turtles, we say which band it's in. Um, but the thing is, you only see those on the surface. And you only got about a 50% chance to get lucky to see those on the surface because you're going to have uh, 185 kilometers an hour, you've got 500 feet. You've got a second or two. So if you see something identified, recorded it through the voice recorder, um, really, you only got a 50% chance of seeing what's on the surface. And there's all those dugong tunnels of water that you don't see. And you only probably, probably seen about 2 and 10 on the surface. So, there's people have been researching this for about 30, 40 years. Um, and I've used their models to collect these accounts for those what we call biases, underestimates.
Um, anyway, just some pretty pictures. So that says stumping dolphins, big tycoons, dugongs. Um, you, you can often confuse the two if you've only got a split second scene. But the snubbies have got that little fin on the back, you know, they've got a similar blunt, blunt nose, and they almost sit on top of each other in tight groups. Whereas the dugongs, you know, they hang around and get a bit spaced out. And they're a bit fatter, they don't have that dorsal fin. So these are the things you look for. In the it's not really a big problem unless they're both occurring in the same area, which is less than a couple of percent of the time. <laughs> uh, we do other animals, bottlenose dolphins, manta rays, humpback whales, of course, some um, spinners, turtles. We do a whole, we've done sea snakes, some really nice data in that demonstrate. <laughs> when it costs so much money to do the surveys, it's silly not to, you know, just to count dugongs when it could be counting all the other animals. Uh, the big thing about the more Kimberley survey, the really big thing is the range of participation. So they're part of the survey team, and this is what the project steering committee wanted. They just didn't want someone to tag along on the airplane. They wanted them to be trained up. And not only that, but also be involved in working out the data, storing the data, uh, pumping out the maps, that sort of stuff. Uh, so we ran a very intense four-day course uh, on on uh, what we call government country, just out of cluster. So we did theory and practical training. It was two certified TOEFL level courses working safely around aircraft and basic air navigation. So that was a big plus, it was a big hit. The rangers really enjoyed it. So we had each one of the rangers that was um, doing the survey in their country involved in that course. This is a pretty picture of science. It was actually, um, yeah, you know, down on there, put the game into a river plateau. It's just down in the middle of nowhere, but that's what it's like around here. Uh, just so, uh, that's just a brief update of where we're at with the training course and how we went about the more King survey. So, I'll just, just give a bit of a school about the Dugong movement and diving behavior study. So, it uses the Argos satellite which is uh, generally the one that people use for wildlife studies. There are other satellites, but that's generally the cheapest one around. So Captain Team, we did this in, um, just at, just at uh, we did some horizontal falls, marine park and damaged sea country. Uh, that's where we first went. And we didn't, we had success with one female, which was going to be great after that. We caught her in about half an hour, and after that we spent days, you know, we spent 30 grand with planes and four boats we spent days and we didn't catch another one after that so we went to down to the peninsula and the boat and we caught four males probably in a couple of days so um anyway uh i don't know if you know much about it but generally you've got a mothership that takes all the gear and um you know you do a lot of process on the mothership you've got a catch boat usually just a few people on it and then there's a radio method where you you zoom up beside the dude long enough to wear it out a bit and you jump in the water and have its tail. You bring it close to the boat, you keep it set above the water with these uh, swim pool plummets to make sure it doesn't drown. Then you put, you know, you measure it, you take a skin sample for the DNA genetic analysis. And then uh, on the tail, you whack this thing here, which has got the drags and satellite tag behind it. So that's a really clunky design, uh, you know, it's out of the arm. I'm really surprised they're still making them sell them. So, you know, in the future, I think we'll look at more streamlined ones and more smaller ones. Uh, the battery life on these things, we've all the data that's sent them back every six hours. It sends back a package of information when the tags on the surface of the water to the satellite. So, every six hours, I get um, how much time the animal spent under the water, how many times it dove, and through GPS tracking exactly how many the, uh, where it is, down to about plus or minus 10 metres. Um, Argos gives you location, but it's plus or minus two and a half K. I've chucked most of those out. I just use the GPS detections. But that, uh, the big thing is that the battery only lasts for six months. And after that, um, you've got to actually, well, you know, we've designed these tags with this bolting, this zinc bolt that actually throws for six months. So it falls off after six months. So if the battery's still going, you can pick up that tag and recycle. So we managed to actually. Pick up most of the tags and lost, which is surprising. 
the turbo line. Um, it's got a weak link too in case the gear gets caught in coral or mangroves, it just breaks and that saves the animal from drowning. So we tagged five out of eight, which is actually not bad considering we hardly saw any in the spotted plains or even out in the water. Uh, so the four males, uh, just north of Panda Bay, you can see one just went a long way. A couple of tags come off pretty quickly. Uh, well, a few tags come off pretty quickly, and that's the female at, um, at Tugger Bay. She actually hung around for a while, fed for a while, and then went to Montgomery Reef and up to Trot, just past North Point. Pretty big distance. Um, but a lot of these tags, uh, they come off pretty quickly, uh, but we managed to get most of them back. Anyway, uh, 14 days of series track, we tracked it for longer than that, but really I cut the data off in 14 days because I think it got caught in the mangroves a lot earlier than that, or a prop got the food on. But she, uh, in 14 days, she moved through to 25 kilometres, so averaging about 23 kilometres a day, and a distance from point of capture about 70k, which is actually 75k. That's pretty impressive just for a small little old female, you know, over a couple of weeks. Uh, so I've just picked one male. So after 78 days of tracking, we haven't got another two free months, but I've got caught in mangroves as well, and I think the tag came on. Uh, that tag's still there, actually fine out, but um, been in the same spot for a couple of months, so hopefully we can get it back. Um, two minute distance moved, 1,160 kilometres, just over two and a half months. Um, about 15 kilometres a day. And about 85 kilometres from the capture point, down to here is half a hundred day. So, you know, the big key finds of this, there's not a lot of data, it's not, you know, but um, basically, you know, supports other studies. So, doing on the capital of moving very big distances over short periods of time, it's pretty awesome actually. No doubt that some dugons would have just hung around in the one spot, you know, it might have been two out, of, two out of five or something like that. But the big thing here is they cost you a stick to all the government's boundaries. You know, so it wasn't, um, you know, we started off the Bali country, we ended up in the middle of the and then heading further south. So it's a shared responsibility. So even if you had the marine parks in that area, uh, maybe you moved it in and out of the marine parks change as well. So, uh, so you know, doing on, just on that basis, do not mention it to be at a regional scale, but because these animals are just crossing boundaries the whole time. And who knows uh, how many go out to sea and go international as well. Some animals that have been trapped in some of the earlier studies just went past through and just kept going. So, um, so really it's uh, you know, the responsibility for looking up to do that. It's just not a local issue, it's actually a, a regional big picture issue. So how do I, um, what, what I had, which was good, and it came out of the Gothic Country reports, and uh, I was given all the GIS layers, you know, um, of all the cultural sites where the hunting sites for Um So what I did was uh, look at the map that we came up with from our Dugong survey. So our Dugong survey was two, two and a half, three weeks, right? We just get this instantaneous picture, you know, just a short, short picture of where they are. A couple of months later, there could be a, you could get a very different map, you know, to see some movements. We have our seagrass map from the uh, satellite images. So we have the indigenous, uh, the cultural knowledge maps of the hunting sites, right? Now that information goes back, who knows, 30, 50,000 years. And it's um, accumulated knowledge, so it's just not a, a map on, a simple little map on a, you know, on, a, on the site here, for example, it's actually accumulated knowledge. It's very valuable, it you know, covers all seasons, all conditions. Uh, so I've given that a very high rating. I've uh, rescaled all the surveys from zero to one to give them a bit of a rating. I've put the two together to come up with a map that actually uh, that recognises indigenous knowledge, um, which a lot of scientific methods don't. So it gives a very high rating, and I've put all the information together. So I've come up with a combined knowledge map. Important to do on the places, so it has shifted things around a bit. 
Um, as you can see, so you know, we flew over some of this area and said, What do you want? But yeah, that's Hartenstein for the dam, it must have been in the past, right? So obviously, um, we didn't see him, we come at the wrong time, you know, in our short survey. Uh, but yeah, that's one way of doing it. Besides using their knowledge to design a more efficient survey. Uh, so that's my recap and introduction. So Marlon is going to talk about them. Studying the survey here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Marley. I'm a Bardi Jawi woman. Um, I grew up in Broome, went down to Perth to study and have recently got work with Cyro and luckily enough they invited me to come up here in May to be involved in the Geelong survey, which was a really good learning experience for me. So I'm just going to share with you guys a bit about the results that we got from the research in May. So basically you can see in this study, um, well you can see here that there was a whole lot of Dugong studies being done around the um, north of Australia and the only gap was here between Robot Bay and Port Hedland, which is the study that we done in May, so that was to fill in that gap. Um, Pete was earlier talking about the North Kimberley and Woodside um, surveys and there's also been some Nigaloo surveys done, which um, I'll tell you a bit about in this as well. So these are our survey blocks. Uh, it was just a bit north of Broome, so a little bit north of Willie Creek, and we went down to south of Port Helen. We divided those areas into three blocks, and they went out to 20 meter bathymetry or 20 meter depth. That was the distance, and our transects were done east to west uh, points. And as you can see down there, that bottom right, sorry, bottom right, um, the the what by doing that we were able to work out not only the number of um, dugongs in the area, but the um, density, so the amount per square kilometre, and that's how we um, that's how we got these results. All right, so here we go. This is uh, the research, but this is um, a combination of all the well, a few researchers. So we've got the North Kimberley um, research in the green at the top. There you can see they only went down to just south of Roebuck Bay. Then our research took over, which is in the blue from Roebuck Bay down to Port Hedland. And then the red and the yellow is um, a dolphin survey that was done around XML Gulf, but they also got Dugong sightings as well. So what you can see from this data is most of our Dugongs were sighted just south of Roebuck Bay and just south of Port Hedland. Uh, that's where most of them were. There were a few um, located around Amar Marine Park, but the higher density areas were just south of Roebuck Bay. Uh, you can see in the green as well, which was the Woodside study, which was done in September 2009, um, that they found a lot of in the Buck Bay as well, but those were more concentrated in the bay, whereas when we were there, they were just south of the bay, so that might have been a seasonal uh, variation from September to May, it could have been a yearly variation as well. Okay, so there we go, so that's just a close-up on the um, on the left there is a close-up of that same data as well, where you can see a Mile Marine Park, and you can see in the blue where there were Dugong sightings, and then Roebuck Marine Park there in the pink up the top. Uh, the one on the right is the snubfin sightings, so everyone knows, you know, we've got plenty of um, snubfins in Robot Bay, but this is just, you know, sharing some more information about that. So there was a pretty widespread um, numbers of those as well as throughout AML Marine Park they were found, so they stretched pretty far. None, as, none sorry, any further than that AML Marine Park marker, so we didn't see any further south than that. Um, but yeah, pretty interesting when you're on the plane seeing them and you're kind of like, oh, is that a Dugong or a Snubfin? But after I first saw my first Dugong, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, they're definitely way fatter. So, <laughs> um, so yes, this is the similar map. This is just showing it more of an abundance level, maybe a bit easier to understand. So as I was saying before, the highest Dugong density was just south of Roebuck Bay for us, as you can see on the map on the right. But the highest snub density was more around directly in Roebuck Bay, a little bit around a bit north of the point of Ganthium out that way. So again, there's the cutoff there for the snub fin, just at eight mile marine park on that image on the right. You can see they were just cut off. But with the dawn, we saw them all the way down to Port Headland. So we actually um, were spotting a few here in Roebuck Bay, had a bit of a gap there for the whole 80 mile marine park area. There weren't very many, there were some, but lower numbers and then hit a few more down there um, for Headland. So 
Cool. Um, so this is with the calves. So this is, um, again, all the studies that have been done, uh, getting some idea about those. And uh, we've sort of got the idea, looking at the calves and the location of the calves, as you can see, there are absolutely none there in the um, Adamal Marine Park area. Uh, theory is that maybe they're more in, um, they're interested in hanging around in shallow bays because um, protection shelter from weather other events, but um, whereas Adamal Marine Park is a bit more open and uh, not as I guess, sheltered and shallow. But yeah, so that's the calf information there. There are a few. Okay, so this is comparing directly the information we got from the 2009 study to the study we've done this year in May. So that's eight years apart. On the left, you can see the Woodside 2009 and the South Kimberley 2017 numbers. So both of them are ranging between 600 to 700. Um, fair little variation there. The error as well isn't huge, so it's not very significant the amount of um, decrease or change in that. And then the density, as well as we said, we were able to figure out through block per kilometer squared the number of dugongs in Robuck Bay was again not hugely significant. The variation from 2009 to 2017, there is a difference, there is a decrease. Uh, it's not massive, um, so I'm not sure if that helps with anything, but we can get yeah, we'll discuss this all at the end and figure out what this all means and how we can move forward from this and figure out what to do next. So yeah, that's really interesting information how that eight years difference, but also please take into account when looking at this that they were done during different times of the year. So one, the Woodside study was in July, this Woodside study and ours was in May. So there may be you know, variations through foraging. Okay, now some, when we were doing the study, as Pete said, we were spotting dugongs and turtles and sea snakes, crocodiles, anything else we could find, uh, dolphins, and this is uh, a map of the density of the dolphins from Broome to Port Hedland, and as you can see, that is very, um, very widespread dolphins all along. It's a really, really prominent spot for dolphins to be found throughout. Uh, again, high concentrations in Roebuck Bay, but you can see on the far on the right, right there's the larger bubbles also throughout the Animal Marine Park area. There was days where you were just like, dolphin, 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 left. Like, so it would not stop and there was plenty of them for us to look at. So yeah, the dolphin population, and this is not specific to species, this is um, species, it was kind of hard to identify species from the plane, but this is basically non snuffing anything but snuffins um, throughout the area. So yeah, really exciting place for all the dolphins. And cool, and also all the turtles. So um, there's plenty of them out there for us. There's um, on the, on Roebuck Bay, it was the highest density again. Um, so in the marine park area there, just further down, they were everywhere again, but um, there were days and times where you just couldn't count them all because there were so many going on all at once. So we'd hit, a spot, hit spots where there'd just be huge clusters of them. So yeah, Roebuck Bay was one of those huge clusters. And then again, you can see that big red um, dot there on the image on the left. Uh, that was around Turtle Island on Port Hedland where they were just all of them gathered into one area and there was just too many to count actually at that point. But again, they were all very widespread. Um, yeah, very, very prominent all the way down. Great. And um, we haven't finalised the data for the May study that we did on sea snakes, but this is a representation of the data from the Woodside 2009 study on sea snakes. Um, so you can see the high concentration there on the Dampier Peninsula, mostly the southern part, uh, and then lesser in the bay. But we are looking at the data, the sea snake data now from the research. Um, I've been going through it and there's plenty there and it's going to come out with some hopefully really interesting results and maybe we'll be able to figure out if there's anything we can use that for, anything we can give back and try and use that and make it valuable. So yeah, we're processing the sea snake data now. Hopefully it's um, useful. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so putting it all together, more from Sarah, um, there's 12 survey blocks. Uh, we only left 
three people who put some to decide to spare. So they just put my book to the box there. Uh, not exact overlap, so it was quite a good effort to chop out the um, overlap areas. Uh, so the total area, about 67,000 square kilometre, which is huge, um, and roughly equivalent north and south of the north and the north. Overall, we actually searched about 8% of the whole area, which um, probably took about six weeks all up. The flying, yeah, four or five hours a day. <laughs> So here are the numbers in a number stage. Now, look, I don't put a lot of emphasis on these numbers, you know. They're just numbers, and what do they really mean, anyway? Um, but they're standardised, which means we can compare what we've done here to all the rest of Northern Australia, and what's been done in Torres Strait. So that's one good thing. We can actually say there's cost as many here than over there, and this is more important than that area, and you know, stuff like that. So, uh, North Kimberley, about 10,500. They're pretty small areas, believe it or not, I was surprised. Um, South Kimberley, 2,000, about five times the number, roughly. But I think that's because it's um, along 80 mile beach. I mean, Rubber Bay's got a good and sort of high density areas, but 80 mile beach, you know, might, it might be really good. Sea grass areas, shallow water lots and stuff, but it doesn't have those deep bays. There's no protection from storms. Um, it's actually a fair stretch, it's almost straight. And I think uh, if you've got cards, I think it's pretty important to have that protection. But that's just me speculating. Um, what really needs to be done there is actually a seagrass survey. You know, all those green areas that we saw from the aeroplane, is that really seagrass or is it just is there our imagination? So that's pretty, that's a research question. That's something to think about. Uh, Dampier Peninsula was, was the only area we didn't. That's your repeat. So that's why I had to use the Woodside 2009 data, but it's only, you know, like seven, eight hundred animals and four from there. So those maps of Mel shown you with maps that I didn't show you of the whole Kingley region, the high density hotspots are here, uh, North Biggie Island, uh, Water Wagala Country, and also Gallant Country medium density. So, so this is important. If you look at all the, all the bays and convoluted coastlines, where the densities are high, so where you get seagrass and all those bays and convoluted coastlines, I think you get that's pretty good for deer Um But that doesn't mean that this area is important because uh, you've got Shark Bay, which is one of the highest densities in the world, uh, next to the Gulf, <coughs> then Blue Western's Gulf, things start to pick up the core headway, and uh, high distance again of green. So that would be a really important move in corridor. So I'm pretty sure these animals are um, more big. Portion of actually dispersing, you know, big distances. So they would have to transverse that from one body into the cash to another. So that would be a new corridor, uh, without a doubt. Um, here are the sub things. So, once again, um, you know, what we got with country, just want to be, there's studies all through there, studies at Port, uh, even if it's a baby spot, come in here. Um, yeah, so uh, that could be interesting. I'm just supposed to distribution on all the maps published in the books is between there, the weeds, and some all the way down here. Uh, we're pretty sure they'll say. So when I say we're 100% certain, nothing's 100% certain. There is a gap on uh, Dampier Peninsula, because it looks like they flew at 900 feet. I couldn't tell that I've experienced part of that height. Um, I reckon they probably would have had a Bit of a problem telling Dugans and Subbies are part of that height. But uh, there's a paper coming in that involves all the indigenous groups. Uh, right throughout the Kingley, where that gap is filled with boat surveys and incidental observations of other people. So it's not really a gap, it's actually being filled. Um, other dolphin sightings, you can actually see the animal beef. Lots of the dolphins, same as broom. And the peninsula, once again, uh, one of the dumb country up there. Uh, well, the, the maps on the left are just the siding maps, and the maps on the right are just a, the contour maps, you know, for the mud and soft spots. So here we have the turtles, you know, the broom. Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's just fishing in the coast. I mean, you've got to be a bit careful with turtles because they seasonally migrate, so it depends what time of month they actually do the survey. 
that I get a little food as fast to go away to brew and come back again. But um, that just gives you an indication of just about everywhere in the kingdom is called the Kudu drill. So these are what I've been thinking about in discussions with uh, all the rangers that have done you know, over the last couple of years since, since we did the survey. You know, where do we go from here with these big last couple of surveys? So the thing is they, they come up every 10, 15, 20 years if you're lucky, you know, they cost so much. So if we get the baseline data, just a map of where they are how many, it's, it's pretty good to get the information really quickly. But to use it regularly as a monitoring program, to get the same errors that we got, um, error levels on the estimates we got, which are pretty good, you have to survey the whole area again at about 8%, costing a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Now you're better off, you know, if you've got, uh, you pick an area that's important to you and you survey that with other techniques, or even fix and survey, uh, put in a lot more lines, you just, you can actually do it more cost effectively using other methods. So I'm recommending uh, both based surveys. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, with a fixed beam baseline surveys, do those every 10 years. Um, but the local surveys, do them more regularly, you know, at least every couple of years. Um, if you've got the funding, do them every year. So we set up some uh, Montgomery Roof at Mary Island, one, one of the other country, Montgomery Roof on Family Country, we set up a post base. Systematic survey, um, which we developed together, we publish this stuff, um, and we've got about eight years of data. It's fantastic data, I think. So that's been going. Um, that's very valuable monitoring information of the site that's important to Jewish owners. So that's what I'm recommending, but also both boats actually sometimes don't work with Google because they're too wary. You know, you've got to drift into them or they just, you know, climb the way they're under the water. Uh, so I'm recommending you to, to look at drones as well. So I've got a bit of a video of drones which we'll look at later, which we just ad hoc, you know, just, just ran and we just this guy just went out and brought this five hundred dollar drone along. You know, we just spent days doing uh road up hey, where are the dooms? And all of a sudden you just picked up these dooms just like that. Just off uh, just off the booty. So I think uh, a lot more thought to be given drones and even small helicopters. They're starting to move the small helicopters in uh, the Northern Territory for localised surveys. Because you don't have that identification problem with some things, you can fly low and slow. Uh, you know, it just changes your whole perspective. And when you look at it, it's probably more cost effective. Um, you know, you have to put floats and that sort of stuff on. But, so that's what I'm recommending is that. Uh, but, don't give up on the aerial survey model program. I reckon if 10 years you come back, it's worth the cost. Have the numbers gone up, have they gone down? Things stay the same. We're basically the three management questions you want to know. Um, but to design these localised surveys, which you're probably more interested in, um, you need to sit down for a day or two. There were a bunch of people who have designed things like this before. Well, the idea is that you tell these designers what's really important to you. And how much confidence you want in the result, how much funding and resources you've got. So you can come up with a, a good local area to sign. <coughs> it's another method. You know, if you really want to estimate exactly how many dugongs there are, like, I really have to question why people want to know exactly how many animals there are. Uh, you know, there's other methods, like um, genetically, you could take a small hundred gram sample of uh, skin tissue, you've got you know, a couple of hundreds of those, you can actually estimate how many dunes in the whole area and what their mortality rate is and their dispersal rates. You know, it's, it costs you $10 million to get that information otherwise. So Sorrow developed that method called Close Skin Genetics, which um, I'm pretty sure you've got, got to be interested in this because Sorrow's got the expertise. We've got the basis, you know, which um, you know, you've got to do a lot of genetic characterisation. That costs a lot of money. It's already been done in a lot of, a lot of places to do that. And they did this for some blue fin tuna, which was endangered. And all the information came back from the fishery said it wasn't being overfished. It was just all made up with a, you know, a bit of corruption in the fishery industry. 
So this method actually showed that you know, numbers were really low, they're on their way into extinction, and they better change their fishing practices. And at the moment, it was costly back then, about five, ten years ago, but now it's really it's cheap to do a sample, 25 bucks. So I'd be recommending that. Be sure what the rule is to know how many there are. But if you've got a, a good standardised technique, a good index of uh, how many there are, that's enough to track trends where the numbers are going up, down, or staying the same. And that's basically what I've always used in my work. I don't really get caught up in trying to work out exactly how many there are. I like to do my research in Australia. Probably spent 50% of the resources just on that question, and I still haven't tracked it after 40 years. And I reckon I could have spent that money doing other things. Um, this is a big important session, so uh, yeah. Um, so basically, this next section, um, we want to have a discussion. Um, we've got some key points we like to talk about, but because it's a discussion, we want you guys to have your heads on, have your thinking hats on. Um, I think maybe a five minute break would be good. Grab a cup of tea and a drink, and then come back and we'll just sit down and have a chat. So these are the points, um, yeah, we're going to talk about. And um, I just learned. TEK stands for Traditional Ecological Knowledge. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> cool, so yeah, five minute break. <laughs>